and the intensity of their management um, by Norse settlers and their descendants. Uh, so just as an example, uh, the woodlands uh, in Iceland have been uh, a topic of um, discussion for some time. Um, the, the ubiquity of woodlands uh, in Iceland and then their steady deterioration from around 900 um, in some areas um, leading to really serious erosion in, in upper and interior areas. Um, and, um, and also it, it being preserved in pockets between farms for um, long periods of time up until um, perhaps the 18th century, um, before the completely deforested Icelandic landscape was created that we can see today. Um, but it's this kind of discussion, this, this um, uh, the, the impact of humans on the Islamic landscape and the vulnerability of that landscape, um, which I think has, has dominated the discussion. And I think what I will try to do um, is, with a few examples, show a kind of alternative perspective um, that places greater emphasis on landscape agency, uh, the landscape variability, and the intimate entanglement and more symmetrical interactions uh, of environmental and human agencies. I'm really interested in this natural variability in the Icelandic landscape that provides different potentialities for economic and social capital, which were used in different ways uh, by Icelanders, in particular um, the Icelandic elite or the aspiring elite. So, if we're to take um, Lanamabok at face value, um, Vatsfjörður, the site in northwest Iceland, um, that's been excavated since between 2004 and 2013. Um, this site was the farm of a landmass man, so one of the first settlers of the country. Um, and it's known from historical and literary sources to be a chieftain's farm from at least the 12th century uh, onwards. Um, but when you um, look at uh, the plan of the site, um, this is the complete plan, uh, the size of the houses are absolutely average, the, the main domestic house is only 50 meters long, and there are a series of seven outbuildings um, that were probably typical for Viking Age farms, although it's very rare for us to have this complete set instead of uh, outbuildings such as a smithy, um, storage buildings, workshops, animal building, um, and, and uh, before this animal building, which you can see in the lower left corner, um, a pit house that was um, used as a small dwelling and, and also for textile production. Um, the Vatsfjörður itself um, did not have great potential uh, in its soil resources to be a great farm for cattle. Um, <coughs> soils are too thin and too well drained to be very productive. Um, and uh, it also, uh, in its animal bone, had a really kind of average assemblage, um, had slightly more sheep than cattle, and a higher percentage of, of wild resources, such as fish, birds, and seals, than other contemporary farms. But what makes the site stand out are really its landscape location and the landscape resources that were available uh, to it. And a number of features on, on the farm that kind of touch on um, the fact that this could have been a special site towards the 10th century. One is the, um, the presence of a couple of very large cooking pits, uh, outdoor cooking pits, which were probably um, associated with very large meals, potentially feasts. A gold pendant that was found in a midden deposit along with some uh, Viking Age beads and a whole bone pin. All of these probably um, accidentally deposited by the floors uh, that, that the house were being cleaned out. This gold pendant was fashioned from uh, a, a gold foil plate from an Irish kite brooch. Um, it was perforated and, and used as a pendant. Uh, there were 150 kilograms of smelting uh, and smithying slime, which had been studied now by Tom Birch, a recent graduate of the University of Aberdeen, uh, in and around that smithy. And 44 kilograms of partially refined iron bloom in a highly structured foundation deposit found under the walls of its animal building that had evidently been placed there when the building was, was replaced in the earlier pit house. This structure deposit was obviously an ostentatious um, allusion to the source of wealth uh, of the household, that is the iron and the bogs and wetlands that surrounded the site. And <coughs> surrounding the site, this kind of key aspect of the site is really its, its superb location 
um, in the landscape. It's on a sheltered, shallow fjord um, on which there were a number of landing sites and natural harbors. Um, and sea level modeling by Jerry Lloyd at the University of Durham and Luke Cashin, who are uh, white check at the University of Aberdeen, have shown that um, the shallow lakes and Kusabab was a shallow bay in the Viking Age, and that on the shoreline adjacent to the site there were um, several boat houses um, that uh, were used over different periods of time as sea level uh, in the area had dropped going back as far as the 11th century and different types of houses around the coastline being used up until the 17th century. Um, so um, the abundance of, of also seaweed on the shoreline, which you can see here, um, was probably an important resource and we find lots of evidence for charred seaweed on the site, uh, including in the smithy. And between uh, Lots River and the, that lake stem from uh, and north of Lots River uh, along its coast, you see a lot of um, wide-ranging wetlands, uh, still drained by streams that run red with iron, uh, and which provide a really rich source of bog iron. Um, some of these areas are still, were still used for peat cutting uh, for building materials and for fuel until really recently. And locations of some of these rich resources are marked by cairns, um, which served as navigational markers in that landscape and could directed people there, both from the sea uh, and from land. Also along the coast are these uh, are seal colonies, still there today, um, and good landing sites, um, which uh, uh, are good landing sites for the last of fishing stations, um, which housed shelters, they so-called sea booths, um, which gave ready access to fishing grounds and a huge uh, deep, these are fjord deep, um, that was just off um, that, the, the small shallow fjord of Lotsfjord. Um, there are also cairns that indicate and uh, kind of facilitate access to these landing sites. And around the headlands, yes, in the neighboring floor, the North River um, was a really rich source of uh, timber, woodland, uh, birch woodland, um, which um, provided that firewood that was really needed for charcoal um, production uh, and fuel. And in written records um, of the rights of access to Bots River to access this woodland go back to the medieval period. And so Provence um, what the soils didn't provide um, in terms of making it a pretty fantastic cattle farm, um, it was the strategy seemed to be looking at these other regional resources, um, focusing on iron production and marine resource exploitation, um, and also um, trade networks, um, uh, bringing in um, beads such as um, uh, these, these eye shape, uh, these eye beads um, and, and other types of Viking Age beads that would have been um, brought in from wider networks on the site. Um, and it really looks like the, the residents of the site took advantage of these valuable resources of bog iron and, and birch wood that the landscape had to offer, um, as well as the topography of that coastline. And I think the ritual burial of the iron resources it, uh, at the site could be argued to be, in a way, a declaration of ownership um, or appropriation consumption or kind of incorporation of that landscape resource into the fabric of that seat of power. At a different site, Fiesbrun in southwest um, Iceland, um, we're looking at the seat of the chieftains of Moscow Valley. Um, and perhaps one of the most famous of these is the the, the saga hero, A.O. Scott Grimson. Um, Pollen work um, uh, has looked at, or from a nearby peat bog, has shown that there was barley uh, cultivated at the site from the 9th century, late 9th century, and there were abundant charley, uh, char charred barley seeds at the site um, that were found in the flotation of samples. Final analysis also showed that there was an emphasis on cattle uh, and um, consumption of cattle at that site. Here you can see that um, it was there's twice as much that the ratio of cattle to caprine bones is, is double at um, at Fries through, which is the one on the left here, um, compared to Lotsfjord, for example, um, and also um, Hofstadter, uh, this the site that Gordon touched upon earlier, which I'll also be mentioning later. Um, here, uh, 
um, the emphasis on Barney and Apple has been interpreted by David Sorey and Jesse Byard uh, in uh, a 2013 paper in Antiquity as being evidence for feasting. And the importance of cattle at the site can also be seen in the structure of the house. In the later phase of the house, they added um, uh, what we know from micromorphological evidence to be a cattle buyer. Uh, and um, this actually extended um, the size of the house, making it uh, 26 meters, and it was so far the third largest house uh, found in Iceland. A um, number of um, beads of this type, eye beads, um, which were originally made in Central Asia, um, circulated around the Viking uh, world, uh, were found at the site. And just comparing um, the numbers of these uh, beads to, uh, to other sites, um, uh, can, there are 34 um, imported glass beads at Abbeysburg, which is double that uh, at Hofstadter and a fourth times more than any other uh, contemporary farm. Also interesting um, is the wood um, that remains that were found in the entranceway to the site, which were um, uh, identified in the thin section by Don Rooney, uh, now at the University of Iceland as belonging to a rainforest deciduous wood, probably oak or ash, um, which uh, was, would have been um, a, a really um, visible, um, uh, prominent location of the house. So it looks like they were, they were um, paving the floor and probably into the ground of the house constructed from imported oak timbers. Um, obviously very visible and bold statement about the wealth and status of the farm. Evidence um, for ferrous metalworking um, it is also evident um, in the house, so uh, micro refuse uh, deposits, which were um, uh, showing evidence of, of uh, uh, iron slag and hammer scale um, in that cattle buyer, so multifunctional um, use of that space. And um, recent work by David Sorry uh, and, and Stanley Colring, um, looking at the, um, the, the harbor at uh, Leerenbogen, very close to um, the site of the priest group, um, has shown that um, it was a sheltered um, lagoon harbor, really well protected. Um, and that this is a harbor that's mentioned a lot in the Icelandic family sagas. Um, and it was, it was obviously a really um, important resource for, for priest group to have that harbor um, and to connect it to these wider um, trade networks, giving it access to um, large seagoing um, vessels as well as local water traffic. Um, so Kreisberg's location in the Icelandic landscape really gave it this potential to develop uh, not only arable agriculture, focusing on barley cultivation, but um, and cattle rearing, but looking um, at this, um, at the, the, uh, the harbor, giving it access to long distance trade networks and importing those items such as um, the timber and the glass beads. Looking at the site of Hofstadter in northeast Iceland, um, here, it's already been discussed by Gordon as a potentially important site um, for, uh, for its cattle sacrifice. Um, it should be noted there was actually also a sacrifice to sheep uh, in the closing phases of the site. Um, and it's a site that, um, uh, it's, it is a fertile site, but perhaps um, not one of the best in the entire country for, for um, producing a good cattle herd, evidence, isotopic evidence of the cattle found at the site is actually showing that they were coming from uh, quite some distance away. So we're not looking at a site that was um, sacrificing its own cattle, but as a site that was a noble point in that landscape um, and was, was uh, bringing people uh, together, uh, bringing their bulls together for these sacrifices from quite some distance away. Um, and. Other evidence at the site that is linking up with the metalworking that we're seeing at these other sites um, is again evidence for, for iron working, lots of slag in the one end of the house, um, and also I think really importantly evidence for non ferrous um, metalworking. Um, there was a silver uh, pendant that was found on the site, but really interestingly, crucible fragments containing silver residues, um, and also with um, a basalt uh, ingot, um, ingot mold that um, was probably for for silver um, ingot production. So here, there's no source of silver in the country. They were importing silver, um, melting it down, and producing new items there on the site, probably as an element of display. Um, and this element of display uh, and, and sacrifice at, at Hofstadter is probably linked to its position in the landscape also 
um, as an important route. You think of Hofstadter as being a gateway to Lake Mila, um, and you know, it's on the, the, the Laxlau River, a really important salmon river, and there was an important route um, between the, the Milotten uh, Lake and the sea that would have passed by uh, Hofstadter. It's a really important um, nodal place, um, a central place um, in this landscape. And finally, the last case study, and I have to finish up now, um, is to look at a site that did not develop, as far as we know, into uh, being a chieftain's farm. Um, and, but it's a, it's a really yeah, interesting site because there's evidence that it could have gone that way um, if resources um, for the site had been a little bit um, longer term. And that's the site of Adelstrite, uh 16 in, in, um, yeah, in Reykjavik, uh, southwest Iceland, where there's some really um, important uh, rare imported um, objects, such as this um, piece of glass, um, a clear glass vessel body shirt that had been blown into a mold. Um, it contains so-called um, uh, great decoration, and it's the only glass vessel fragment that's so far um, been found in Viking Age contexts in Iceland. Um, but what's really interesting um, about the site, um, well, I should mention first the, the, the animal bone assemblage, as you can see, uh, dominant um, in, in pig bones. Pig bones make up 77% of the uh, identifiable domestic animal bone assemblage at the site, which was not a huge assemblage, I have to say, preservation was not good. Um, but a really important emphasis on pig, uh, which uh, is going to be important as you'll see. Um, and um, what's interesting about the site, it has um, three walrus tusks, um, all of which um, were upper left canines, but three separate. Um, walrus. Um, they have cut marks to show that they were really um, uh, skillfully extracted um, from the, the maxillary bone of the walrus. Um, and Tom McGovern has, um, has written that these are probably evidence for a really competent um, extraction done by craft, uh, craft workers really experienced at handling of walrus ivory um, and, and conducting walrus butchery. Now, clearly visible to anybody um, looking at the west side of the house would have been two uh, really important deposits connected to walrus. One is an articulated walrus vertebral column that was in the base of the turf wall, and the other a walrus scapula um, that was at the base of the, the, the wall um, closer to um, the southwest door. Um, there were also um, notably several well-preserved walrus bones at the nearby Viking Age site of Tarnagata. Um, and Tom Govern has suggested that there was very likely a really important um, walrus colony uh, very close to these sites that was providing <coughs> So um, at the site, it looks like over time, um, the loss of local woodland, potentially due to um, the <coughs> intensive pig husbandry, um, and the loss of the walrus colonies in the local area, um, may be an explanation for why the site, which really had the potential to grow into, into a chief and seat. So just to conclude, um, I think that um, at the site, the, the human landscape interactions, um, this engagement of Viking Age medieval Icelanders with their landscape and the plant and animal and soil resources, can be reframed as one that was more symmetrical, kind of mutual domestication in which humans were changed by the landscape as much as the landscape was changed by them. And like all Icelanders, the aspiring elite were deeply entangled with the landscape, and the variability of the Icelandic landscape led to a lot of variability you know, in its expressions of power. So power structures created were therefore highly localized and contingent. They um, not, not only contingent on the specific potentialities of the part of the Icelandic landscape that a particular um, group called home, their clan called home, but the long-term sustainability and, if possible, for the improvement of those potentialities. The threats to local resources of wealth, prestige, um, and power um, were, were disastrous um, to local power structures. Um, and the silting up, for example, of a harbour um, that um, had kept an elite farm like this group connected to international trade networks, or the loss of woodland that had supported swine husbandry, or the eradica eradica eradication of local sea mammal resources such as walrus, 
well, or the loss of the ability to ripen barley and produce your own beer due to a deteriorating climate, then all such losses of local potentiality and sources of power must have contributed to the tensions between neighboring um, elites as, as losers attempted, um, uh, perhaps sometimes by violent means, to obtain somebody else's resources, um, and the powerful tried to take advantage of the belief. I would, I would suggest that this steadily escalating conflict in Iceland in the 13th century between the Icelandic uh, elite, which really culminated in a situation that's tantamount to uh, civil war, should be seen within this context of entanglement within the Icelandic.